Seven democratic powers invited India and South Africa to this week's G7 summit, but the result may not be so clear-cut. One G7 member nation in particular remains deeply involved in China's Belt and Road Initiative. For now, its next move remains to be seen. China is pushing for the largest military buildup in history, and the head of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command is ringing alarm bells over it. The U.S. Air Force is on the move. That's in response to advanced fighter jets that China has developed. One South Pacific Island nation says it's standing by Taiwan. It withdrew from a United Nations conference in protest of China's threat to the island. And another country takes a similar stance, recognizing Taiwan as the only China. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Don Ma, sitting in for Tiffany this week. Amid this week's Group of Seven summit, the West is criticizing the Chinese communist regime. Leaders of the world's major democracies have urged China to use its influence with Russia and stop its invasion of Ukraine. In a G7 summit statement, they also requested that Beijing drop what they called its expansive maritime claims in the South China Sea. Those messages come alongside unprecedented levels of criticism towards Beijing's policies and human rights record. Now, a standoff appears to be brewing between the two blocs, one of them led by the U.S. and the other by Russia and China. Both are trying to expand their alliances, but who are they looking to have join their ranks? Let's zoom in. This week's Group of Seven, or G7, summit invited India and South Africa to participate. Its democratic members appear to have a new goal, expanding their front against Beijing and Moscow. But India and South Africa may not be shoe-in allies. Both of them also attended the recently concluded BRICS virtual summit, hosted by China. BRICS members are among the most influential developing countries, China, Russia, India, Brazil, and South Africa. During the meeting last week, Beijing helped Russia to return to the international stage after its invasion in Ukraine. On top of that, Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping took aim at the U.S. for expanding military alliances and over sanctions. Back in Europe, the G7 summit has been in full swing in Germany this week. Leaders from the U.S., the U.K., Canada, France, Germany, Italy and Japan, as well as the European Union, were present. Germany also invited Indian Prime Minister Modi, plus leaders from South Africa, Indonesia, Senegal and Argentina. Among the guests, India, South Africa and Senegal abstained from the UN Security Council vote on a proposal to condemn Russia. A number of the guest countries invited to the G7 are also those Putin has an eye on. During the BRICS virtual meeting, he suggested the group's five member nations should expand ties with countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America. India is one of those caught in the middle of the two blocs, trying to balance relations between Russia and Western countries. Despite the robust trade between India and China, an ongoing border dispute and a violent clash in recent years has both countries in defense mode. At the same time, Russia is a major source of weapons and energy for India. Beyond India, Indonesia is also in the spotlight, as it is slated to host the G20 summit later this year. Russian President Putin already confirmed he would attend. Indonesia also invited Ukrainian President Zelensky. Nations around the world are responding to a new infrastructure plan. The Group of Seven or G7 member nations represent the world's wealthier democracies. Leaders from those countries made an announcement over the weekend that $600 billion would be invested in developing countries. The move seeks to counter the Chinese regime's expansion there, especially through its Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative. W. Gud Moore is a former minister from Liberia, Africa. He told the South China Morning Post that Africa has the greatest need for infrastructure improvement in the world. He welcomed the G7 proposal, but voiced doubts it would actually happen. Under former President Trump, the U.S. introduced the Prosper Africa Initiative, but the administration could not carry out the plan before leaving office. On the other hand, Beijing has built ports, railways, highways and power dams in Africa for years through the Belt and Road Project. The G7 infrastructure plan supported by the Biden administration largely plans to address four main areas, climate and clean energy, telecommunications, gender equity and health systems, including vaccine manufacturing. 
News of President Biden's $200 billion infrastructure pledge has made a splash amid the G7 summit. The plan is part of U.S. efforts to counter the Chinese regime. Next, let's zoom in on Italy. The only G7 member that's also a partner to Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative. Here's more. Italy announced its membership in China's Belt and Road Initiative in 2019. The news soon sparked disapproval from the U.S. and EU leaders. Under the deal, China promised to invest more than $210 billion in Italian infrastructure. Unlike other G7 countries, Italy has been grappling with serious financial dilemmas for years. Since 2009, the Italian government's credits and debts have been in crisis. When China became the third largest economy that same year, Italy turned to China for help. The country sought more opportunities to boost exports and develop tourism, hoping to raise its economy. But Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative hasn't made as big of a difference in China-Italy economic collaboration as planned. Most of these successful developments between the two nations were achieved before Italy joined the Belt and Road and a number of other to-do list items were under-fulfilled. That's including the space station coalition between the two countries. On the other hand, what roles do the U.S. and EU play in the Italian economy? According to the U.N. ComTrade database, more than half of Italy's exports were sent to countries within the EU in 2021. It also shows that 10 percent of Italian goods go to the United States, compared to 3 percent that go to China. On top of that, when Italy was hit by COVID-19 in early 2020, the U.S. authorized up to $100 million to assist the Italian government. The Chinese Communist Party is having its largest military buildup in history since World War II. That's according to Admiral John Aquilino, commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Speaking at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, he said buildup covers all military domains and capabilities. That includes naval ships, fifth-generation aircraft, missile forces, and cyber, as well as space and strategic nuclear capabilities. Aquilino stressed the importance of Guam to the U.S. in the Indo-Pacific. The island is home to more than 120,000 U.S. citizens, but it's now facing a 360-degree threat from rocket forces within the People's Liberation Army. And Aquilino pointed to the U.S. partnership with Japan and South Korea, saying the U.S. can operate as a joint force across vast distances. The U.S. Air Force is reacting to the development of advanced fighter jets by foreign adversaries like China. The Air Force is reactivating a squadron that includes F-35s, one of the most advanced stealth fighter jets in the world. Let's take a look. The U.S. Air Force reactivated the 65th Aggressor Squadron in a ceremony at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada earlier this month. The new unit also gets its first F-35 stealth fighter jet. During a combat training mission with other pilots, the 65th Aggressor Squadron replicated the tactics and techniques of U.S. adversaries. General Mark Kelly heads the Air Combat Command. He said they are doing this due to the growing threat posed by Communist China's development of fifth and sixth generation fighter jets. And that, quote, precisely because we have this credible threat, when we do replicate a fifth gen adversary, it has to be done professionally. The F-35 stealth fighter jet is a fifth generation fighter jet because it has low observable technology. The only other countries that operate fifth-generation jets are China and Russia. Colonel Scott Mills commands the 57th Operations Group. He said that using the F-35 as an aggressor allows pilots to train against low observable threats similar to what adversaries are developing. The 65th Aggressor Squadron was active from 2005 and 2014, and back then they flew the F-15s, which are fourth-generation fighter jets, because they don't have stealth characteristics. NATO is planning its biggest overhaul since the Cold War. During a summit this week, leaders of the world's most powerful military alliance will show their strength and unity in support of Ukraine's resistance to Russia. NATO says it will change its language on Russia and describe it as the most significant and direct threat. NTD's Joy Duguid has the details. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, is meeting in Madrid this week with the Ukraine war as one of the main topics. 
The organization's secretary general, Jens Stoltenberg, said the summit would be transformative for the alliance. At the summit, we will strengthen our forward defenses. We will enhance our battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance up to brigade levels. We will transform the NATO response force and increase the number of our high readiness forces to well over 300,000. Stoltenberg said the plan would constitute the biggest overhaul of NATO's collective deterrence and defense since the Cold War and the Alliance would decide on a new strategic concept for a new security reality. Our new concept will guide us in an era of strategic competition. I expect it will make clear that Allies consider Russia as the most significant and direct threat to our security. Stoltenberg said Ukrainian President Zelensky would be invited to join the summit. The Allies will agree to a strengthened comprehensive assistance package for Ukraine, with deliveries of secure communications, anti-drone systems and fuel. Over the longer term, we will help Ukraine transition from Soviet-era military equipment to modern NATO equipment, and further strengthen its defence and security institutions. The Secretary General said NATO's plan would also address China. China's neighbours, including Australia, Japan, New Zealand and Korea, have been invited to attend the summit for the first time. It will address China for the first time and the challenges that Beijing poses to our security, interests and values. Speaking before departing for the summit, President Tayyip Erdogan said Finland and Sweden must take Turkey's concerns into consideration. Turkey has blocked bids by Sweden and Finland to join NATO, accusing them of supporting groups Ankara views as terrorists. Joy Dugid, NTD News. The United States is drawing closer to one of its biggest allies in Asia. On Friday, the U.S. Navy's top commander in the Pacific told the Japanese defense minister that the U.S.-Japan alliance was the cornerstone of security in the Pacific. That's as Japan reports increasing threats from China, North Korea and Russia. I have to say that the security environment in the region has grown more severe. The Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Forces and U.S. Navy have established a close cooperative relationship so far, and the significance of this cooperation is only increasing. In response, U.S. Admiral Sam Paparo said this. I agree entirely with your comment of the increase in the severity of the security challenge in the Pacific. And I'm very happy to report to you that the tight coordination and integration of Kaijo Jetai U.S. Navy forces have paced and outpaced our potential adversaries' operation. Japanese authorities say that at least eight Russian and Chinese warships were spotted last week near Japan's coasts, and that Chinese Coast Guard ships have repeatedly infiltrated the Japanese-controlled East China Sea near the Senkaku Islands. Beijing also claims that area as its own. Japan's defense minister Nuburo Kishi told Paparo that the American naval presence in the region is indispensable to maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific, a framework that the Allies have promoted to counter China. Given the current tensions in the Indo-Pacific region, Kishi said that further cooperation between Japan and the United States is necessary. Japan has pledged to further bolster its military readiness over the next five years and is working on a revision of its security strategy in the face of international threats. The South Pacific island nation of Tuvalu stood by Taiwan during a United Nations Oceans Conference on Monday. Tuvalu Foreign Minister Simon Kofi withdrew from the conference after China tried to block their Taiwanese delegates from attending. Beijing claims Taiwan as its own territory, though it's never been ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. The island is not a member of the United Nations and its citizens are unable to attend UN events. The island is largely excluded from international organizations that China is a member of. Taiwan's foreign ministry thanked Tuvalu for its support and condemned China, saying, quote, 
China's arbitrary pressure on member states has only once again revealed its nasty nature. In response, Beijing repeated its claim that Taiwan is part of China. Tuvalu has had diplomatic ties with Taiwan since 1979 and is one of just 14 states around the world that continue to have diplomatic relations with Taiwan rather than China. And Tuvalu isn't the only nation backing Taiwan. Guatemala's president expressed similar support in a media interview last week. Referring to his country, he said, quote, We are the largest ally that Taiwan still has, and while I am president, I will only recognize one China, and it is called Taiwan. That comes after related comments from Chinese state media Global Times. The publication had hinted that the country would turn away from Taiwan and towards China in an earlier article. Taiwan's central news agency reported that the president's comments marked the first time he had openly clarified Guatemala's stance on this issue since the Global Times article. Guatemala's foreign minister also reaffirmed relations with the U.S. and Taiwan and said the country will continue to maintain them at all levels. And that's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what to look for in our second half. Our own Tiffany Meyer is in D.C. this week for a summit on religious freedom. She spoke with a former U.S. ambassador at large for international religious freedom about his take on the threat of communist China. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Don Ma. See you tomorrow. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com.